want to welcome those of you who are joining by video this morning. Uh, we're glad that you are with us today as well. Our hope is that we will all open ourselves up to the work of the Lord today, to His Word and His Spirit, and that He will come and move in us, teaching us and calling us deeper into His life. We are looking at uh, a passage in Scripture today that is probably very familiar to Christians. Uh, we're in God, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 15, and I want to invite you to go ahead and turn there uh, this morning. But I want to put it in context just for a minute. Uh, I'm launching right into the Scripture because, as you can see, we're going to celebrate communion today, and there is a significant connection between our passage in Scripture and the, the, the gift, the sacrament that God has given us in communion. And so I want to talk about that. But we're in, we're in John's Gospel, chapter 15, the vine, right? The true vine that, that Jesus spoke of uh, as a way of identifying himself. And he spoke of uh, his, his relationship to our Father, to God the Father, Speaking of himself as the vineyard or the vine and the father as the gardener. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But again, I want to set this in context. Remember that at this place in, in Jesus' walk, his life with his disciples and, and those around him, he had various stages in which he was revealing himself and he had various points that he wanted to make depending on who he was with. In this particular instance, he is with his closest disciples. In the chapters of John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 are all a part of a, a discourse, uh, a, a conversation, a, a way of being and sharing intimately with his closest disciples. This was occurring just before he was to give up his life. And so you can imagine as he was with his dear friends, his closest disciples, disciples, his closest associates, those who he had poured himself into the most, he was trying to, to really help them understand all that he wanted to tell them. Because he knew that in a very short time, he would no longer be with them in the way he had been. He'd no longer be with them in person. And he knew that they were going to have to continue to be his disciples, continue to, to walk in the way he'd been teaching, to live out their faith with him not physically present like he had been. And so it was important that he give them the full dose, if you will, of his teaching. So that's where we pick up the story this morning. Again, we're in, in John's Gospel, chapter 15. I'm just going to read for you the first eight verses. That's what I want to talk about today. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Let me stop right there and say, wait a minute. If you're following this, you're saying, okay, wait a minute. It said that he prunes, but then he cleans. Well, the word that's translated from the Greek there can mean either prune or clean. That's important to remember as you hear this passage. Jesus is talking about pruning in a way that has a similar effect that cleaning might. I'll say more about that in a minute. So I want to read that part again. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes or he cleans so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will hear, excuse me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. 
If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This may be a little hard to relate to for those of us living in the 21st century, particularly in cities, because let's face it, we don't have a lot of agriculture around us anymore. We don't have vineyards to relate to. We don't have uh, quite the same connection to the land that maybe those living in that day who were very much in an agrarian culture were living in. It reminded me when I was studying this of a, a guy that was a good friend of mine in, uh, in Kentucky, central Kentucky, when we lived there, Peter Cooper. Peter was, uh, he owned a nursery and he and his sons uh, and his wife worked there and Peter used to say, and it's not a direct quote, but he used to say that, you know, the farther we Christians get from the land, the farther we get from God. Let me say that again. He used to say the farther we get from the land, the farther we get from God. You might think, well, why would he say that? Well, there was a number of reasons. First of all, Peter was intimately familiar with the land and what grows out of the land because that's what he did for a living. As a Christian, he believed in God as the creator. And so he was constantly thinking as he was out working with whatever uh, plants, trees, whatever he was working with, he was constantly thinking about these are things God has created. He's created them for a purpose. He's created them to, to function in a way that fits his design. Now I mentioned that to you this morning because again, most of us don't l work in an agrarian job. Most of us don't live uh, in a place where we're on a big farm. Some do. But most of us live in cities. You may live in a, in a townhome or a condo. You may live somewhere where you don't even have to keep up with your own uh, lawn, bushes, whatever you may have. So it might be a little difficult to relate. So I want to unpack it a little bit more for you this morning and tell you that, that I live in a house, Ann and I live in a house that doesn't have a big yard, but it is our house. Well, we're, we're paying for it. I guess it's the bank's house. But we live in a bank's house <laughs> that has a yard and has shrubs and trees and that sort of thing. And, oh, it's been several weeks, maybe a month or, or more ago, that I was out trimming shrubbery and watching. I had, we had, we had some really overgrown shrubbery, and so I had a lot of it cut way back. And I don't know if you've had that experience before, but some shrubbery that you can have, you can, you can have huge shrubbery it can almost be like trees and they can be filled with big woody stems coming up and you've got to prune that stuff back to get it to fill out down below but when you cut it way back it just particularly in the winter time it just looks like wood there's no leaves there's no nothing and you think oh my gosh i hope i didn't kill this thing you know well i had several of those cut way back and they were just woody stems now, they weren't just the trunks coming up. They were little branches off. But I found myself wondering as spring was nearing, okay, Lord, I know in my head that these things are going to come back, but I'm not seeing any evidence of it yet. So I'm counting on your design to bring new life out of these what look like dead wood stems. Well, when I was preparing for this passage, I was remembering that, and I thought, you know, there's a real... There's a real connection here. So I went out to see what I could find. And of course, everything is blooming now, so I'm a little late in doing this. But I brought in a couple of what I thought looked very similar, little twigs, really. They're off the same shrubbery. Laura Petulum, if you're familiar with that. I'm learning a little bit about shrubbery. And, uh, you know, I looked at these two things, and I thought, well, these are exactly the same. They just look like dead little woody twigs growing on my, my plant that is otherwise beginning to bloom. I guess these things are just dead. I guess we'll just have to you know, break them off so the new life can grow and these won't, won't just be ugly looking dead stems. 
Well, the one of them is just that. I cut it off, and you can't see this because you're too far away and it's too small. But when I cut this one off, the inside of the wood is just like I expected. It's brown. It's dead. There's no life in this little twig anymore. And, you know, if I took it and just, well, then that's what happens. Right? You could hear it snap and it breaks because it's dead. There's no life in it. And so I moved to another one, and I thought, oh, yeah, well, there's another one. So I went to break it off, and something interesting happened. Well, maybe it's not dead. It looks dead. I don't see anything on it. And then I looked really close, and again, you can't see this, but if you got really close, you'd notice that on this one little twig, there are a couple of little buds that I guess are going to bloom. But from a distance, it looked the same as that one. And I was thankful that I grabbed it up here and didn't break it off when it bent because I thought, well, if it's bending, it's still got life in it. It's an interesting metaphor for our lives. Sometimes what we see on the outside doesn't reflect what's going on on the inside. And that's actually the hope Always, because let's face it, we don't always look on the outside like we'd like to. Not just in our appearance, but in our behavior, in our actions. Sometimes we appear in ways that would give people the wrong impression. Maybe wouldn't be able to identify us as we'd like to be identified. And they might, if they do know that we are Christian, they might look at us and think, yeah, you're just like all the rest of what you talk about being dead wood. I don't see the actions that I'm expecting to see. What makes you any different? Well, the truth is that if we're looking only externally, there might not be any difference. I mean, you and I can try really hard to act in ways that separate us from those people who are doing something that we would consider not acceptable. But the reality is none of us are perfect. None of us are always going to be acting on top of our game, so to speak. And you could probably rightfully look at me or others at, on occasion and say, I don't see much difference. The good news, and we're about good news, right? That didn't sound very convincing. So I won't ask you yet. I'll just tell you. I'll remind you. We're about good news, folks. Not our own good news, but good news given to us. That's why we celebrated Easter. That's why we're still celebrating Easter. Because we're about good news. And when we don't look the way we wish... We're even more thankful that that's not the end of the story. That we have good news. And we're counting on that good news. So how does this relate? How does this tie in? And especially with what we're talking about here. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. But let me tie this back into our story. Jesus is reminding us that as branches, if we don't stay close to him, if we don't stay connected to him, if in fact who he is is not represented in us because if his life is not actually in us, this is our end. And it may come sooner than later. We're not going to last no matter how good we are. No matter what we produce that may look good for a time, no matter how successful we may be for a time, eventually, the leaves will fall off, the productivity will stop, and we will be expendable. We will be disposable. We will be no longer life-giving, fruit-bearing, people and what happens to that well like 
can always go down the road of talking about judgment because we are going to be judged by God. But I'm not going to go there today. Today I'm just simply going to stop and say, well, if there's no life in us and we don't continue to produce good for those around us, probably just be discarded because there's no real benefit or use to continuing. If, on the other hand, as Jesus said, we need to stay close like a branch connected to a vine. Well, if you know anything at all about plants, you know that the trunk coming up has, has water in it, it has nutrients in it, it has all that the branches need to continue to live. It, in fact, has everything it needs for the, to come up through the trunk into the branches to then produce blooms and flowers and seed, whatever else. It continues to serve the purpose that it was created for. And it brings enjoyment to other people. It brings blessing to other people because it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's blooming. And maybe it brings beauty. Maybe it brings fruit that we can eat. Maybe it provides shade. There's all sorts of, of benefits that come from the plants and trees. That if we would take Peter Cooper's advice and pay attention to the land, we would see evidence of our Lord. We would see evidence of His grand design and the, the beautiful way of being that we can be with each other if we stay connected. Jesus said for the, vine, for the branches that stay connected to the vine, His Word, the nourishment that we need to live fruitfully would remain in us. If we remain in Him, connected to Him, He will remain in us and connected to us. And eventually, the little buds will become blooms. And the world around us will see Him because they see the fruit that we produce. It's a powerful story. It's a powerful metaphor. It would have meant a lot to the people in that day. And I hope that as we think on this, even if you're doing like I'm doing, just out trimming back shrubbery, maybe you'll pause and think, I wonder which of these branches I am. Am I still connected in such a way that it's not just what I do, but it's the actual life in me that is Jesus? It's the life in me when nobody sees what's going on that is continually feeding me and giving me hope for producing good and blessing others. And bringing about His will. The whole reason I was created in the first place. That's what staying connected can do. Again, Jesus reminds us that staying connected keeps us in a place that God can use us for His purposes. And in this story, he speaks of him as the father. Remember the father who prunes and cleans. Well, if you're cleaning up your shrubbery, if you're pruning back so that a new life will come out of it, you're giving it an opportunity to continue to be available to God to do his work. Well, what does that look like in our lives? Well, it's staying connected to Jesus. It's staying connected to Him through His Word. It's staying connected to Him through prayer. It's staying connected to Him in such a way that He feeds our very life and being. And when we're that connected to Jesus, then He can continue to do all kinds of good things in us because it's just our nature. It's our connection to Him that enables that. This is what this story is about. This story is about staying connected to Jesus. Not just doing what He wants us to do. 
Because again, how many times have you and I tried? How many times have you and I said, okay, I'm going to start over and I'm going to do this this time. And then sometime later we think, oh man, how am I back here where I was? But if I stay connected to him, that life continues to feed into me. And eventually, the fruit comes. Folks, I'm sharing, you, sharing with you this story today with the communion elements in front of us. Because this is another way of staying connected to Jesus. We've spoken before about the meaning behind communion that, that this juice and this bread represents His blood and His body. And I mean, I can eat this bread and it nourishes me. But just eating bread doesn't make me Jesus, right? And I can drink this juice and it nourishes me. But it doesn't just make me Jesus. But in the mystery of God, in the mystery that is difficult to even grasp all of what it means, God gave us Jesus who gave up Himself, who gave up His blood and His body. And somehow, in His calling us to do this in remembrance of Him, as He calls us to, to repeat this meal, to take into us these common elements, somehow in the mystery of God, when we ask Him to do so, when we do this, intentionally remembering what Jesus did for us, He actually feeds us. We, we talk about it in language like we say, Lord, be in me and be for us your body broken for us, your bread that feeds me. And be for me your blood. Give me that life-giving blood that runs through me Jesus' blood. I don't mean for that to sound sick or gross. I mean for it to sound hopeful. That's what Jesus meant. He meant for us to realize that in the mystery of God, every time we remember what He did, God can feed us and nourish us, and it's a way of staying connected to Him. It's a powerful metaphor just like what I was trying to explain with these twigs. It's a powerful way of remembering what He did for us and what He still does for us and what He promises to continue to do for us as we remember Him. So we come to His table today. We come to His table. We come to the table of the true vine we come to the table of the bread of life and we ask God to do that. Now we use certain words. We use a ritual, if you will. It's just a, a formal way of putting into writing what we believe. It's a way of remembering in, in written form what Jesus has done for us and what he wants to continue to do for us. There are different ways of doing this. I'll use one of those this morning and invite you to participate. At some point, I am going to make this available to you, either on the screens or in print, so that you can actually follow along with me and say some of the words with me. But for now, in these initial months where we're celebrating communion once a month, the first Sunday of each month, I want you just to listen and think about what God has done for us and what these words mean. The invitation is the way we start, and it's simply that you're invited to the Lord's table. That the, the table is set for us because He set it for us. He gave up His life, His body, and His blood, and set the table. And it's in the company of all those who believe in Him that we come to this table. Some are gathered with us today. But we remember all those throughout history since Jesus came that we celebrate this. 
because we identify what we're doing with him. It's a table of communion. It's a table of communing with him. It's a way of saying, Lord, I remember you and I, I ask you to continue to feed me and remake me in your image. So I invite you on, on behalf of the Lord, I invite you to come to this table. Any of you who would like to come, those of you who have had faith for a long time, those of you who are maybe new to faith, those of you who have practiced this before and it has special meaning, those of you who this is kind of new and you're still learning what this means. But one thing in common, whichever camp you fall in, whichever way you come, remember this. This is a gift of immeasurable value. And so we don't come lightly. We come recognizing that this is not something we could earn. We can't buy this. This is something we can only receive. And in order to receive it, we have to acknowledge that we need it. We have to acknowledge before God that we need desperately the gift that he's given us. And one of the ways to do that is simply to confess. It's to confess that we are inadequate by ourselves. It's to confess that we need him and we are repenting. We're changing from depending on ourselves to depending on him. Pray with me as I read this general confession that represents all of us. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, creator of all things and all people, rightful judge of all, you, Lord, of great mercy, have promised forgiveness and deliverance to all who turn to you with true heartfelt repentance and actioned repentance, changing our ways. Those of us who have true faith, trusting in you and your word, we confess to you that we've sinned against you and we're hopeless without your grace. Have mercy on us. Merciful Father, have mercy upon us and pardon us, forgive us, deliver us from our sins. Forgive us for the blindness of the heart and lack of love. Forgive us for falling to the deceits of the world and the flesh and the devil. Forgive us from having wrong beliefs and from not spending the time in your word that we, that we ought to. Lord, free us from the anxiety and the lack of our trust. You're our Savior. Save us this day. Keep us close to you. And forgive us our sin. Help us, Lord, to live strengthened in the newness of life that you've given us in a way that will honor you and praise you through the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, we pray not only for ourselves, but we do pray for ourselves. We ask you, God, to give us good health and sound minds. We ask you to give us strength to earn our living, our daily bread. Free us from the worry and the unending labor. Keep us safe as we travel and protect us from enemies. May our homes be strong, Christian homes. And may we be good and kind neighbors. Lord, out of your great compassion, provide for us what we need. And grant us the peace to live out the life you've called us to live. But we pray for others too, Lord. We ask you to be with the sick and the, the weak and those who are dying. We ask you to be with the widows and the orphans and the poor and the oppressed. We ask you to be with those who are lonely or discouraged or grieving the loss of a loved one. Those who are heartbroken. We ask you to be with those who are in bondage to sin. Who can't seem to break free from bad habits. We ask you to be with those who just simply don't acknowledge you. Those who don't have any knowledge of the gift of salvation that you offer us. 
Lord, send us out to them. Send us out as an act of our own gratitude to give them the good news that you make available to all people. Help us, Lord, we pray in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. You know, when we take these elements, when we receive this meal, just like you would in a friend's house, just like if you went to a neighbor's house that invited you over, you wouldn't just take it and walk out. You'd thank them. And we want to thank God for this incredible meal. So I'm going to again lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving and invite you to join me. Lord, we give you thanks for all your goodness because you're good in all.